What is the most used man-made material on earth? You guessed right, it's concrete. Look around, it's everywhere. Sidewalks, driveways, foundations, floor you stand on, and even entire buildings are made out of concrete. So why don't we discuss it more? In each episode of Concrete Logic, we'll explore one concrete related topic with the help from industry professionals that are shaping the future of the trade. We'll talk with suppliers, contractors, architects, engineers, specialists, and even some proponents of competing materials about their views of concrete and their vision of its future. Welcome to another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast, and today I have Ryan Benson with UFP. Uh, Ryan, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my name is Ryan Benson, work for UFP Concrete Forming Solutions. Uh, I've been an employee with UFP for 21 years. It'll be 22 years here in January. Um, you know, about myself personally, started out in the industry as a, a buyer of engineered wood and uh, panel products, did that for about nine years, and then ended up in different levels of sales and, and management the last uh, 12 years. And the last seven years has really been all focused on um, our initiatives of, with growing in the concrete forming industry. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so I was uh wanted ryan to come on because i think he has a unique perspective of uh uh, and ufp obviously of dealing with not just uh um concrete folks like us um but also they buy wood they buy lots of wood i I think are you guys the largest buyer of wood products in the country is that correct softwood lumber yes sir oh wow so uh i'm looking at uh I, i like this uh website uh, tradingeconomics.com where you can kind of see the commodities, the prices of commodities, uh, what they're trading at. And I'm always fascinated with wood. Uh, I always check in on how wood's doing. And, uh, so I thought it'd be cool if you could kind of, uh, I don't, you don't have to tell us everything, but if you could, uh, uh, pull back the curtain a little bit and, and share with us how y'all been de- dealing with, uh, the, uh, the crazy pricing of wood and how it's, uh, been going up and down on y'all. Um, uh, I'm just looking at the last year and it looks like wood peaked at, um, uh, so they sell it in a thousand board feet. At yep. least that's how they track it on, on this, commo- uh, this, this website. And it looks like it was about 1400 bucks and it's been down to about 400 <laughs> and today yeah. it's around five, 520, 530. So it, 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 I mean, if you look at a chart, it's, it's crazy. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. So how, how do you guys deal with that? And what does that look like on your side of the fence? Yeah. I mean, I should start out first, Seth, by just saying that what I'm going to share are my opinions. It's not the opinions of UFP industries or our shareholders, large, you know, 8 billion corporations. So yeah, gotta be careful there. Um, and it's a commodity for a reason, right? So everybody's going to have an opinion on it. Nobody's going to have a crystal ball because it's a commodity. And that's the definition of a commodity that nobody's going to have a crystal ball. But I can give you a lot of insight for somebody that's been in it from from 21 years. And that, that'll just be my opinions. Um, I, you know, the, the craziness of the lumber market and it, if you look in the last two years, you'll see some really volatile spikes up and down in the market and so much of that has to do with COVID and, uh, you know, low interest rates and, and all that. So it's always based on supply and demand. And when, when COVID hit, we all panicked, right? Everybody in the lumber industry panicked and said, okay, let's get ready. There's going to be a massive recession and stop buying, um, you know, lean out inventories, even from the sawmill side, you know, they all saw the same thing. Well, we better scale back production and, you know, after 60 days, I think of everybody being tied up in their homes and, and needing something to do, it said, hey, why don't I go fix that fence? And why don't I go repair that deck? And, um, you know, uh, other people that were maybe ready to go into a bigger home and wanted more space, low interest rates, you know, the housing started to kick off. And we started seeing it in all different aspects of our operations from our, our retail side to our site built side and, and our 
you know, the concrete forming side never really shut down. We definitely had big pauses and certain parts of the country paused harder than other parts, but we all limped along through it. So, um, lo and behold, everybody was thinking lower your inventories and lower production. And then there, there was a spike. There was a, a demand that grew out of that first 60, 90 days of being people hold up and wanting to do these projects and they needed more lumber. Right. And I think if you went into Home Depot, was that uh, 2020 and probably May, June, you would have seen like the aisles were picked clean in lumber. Um, and as all the suppliers went and called the sawmills to try and buy more, they were at like 50% capacity and it was nothing they could do. Either their employees had COVID or they were on, you know, trying to fight through the, um, you know, manufacturing processes with having COVID around and having limited capacities. And there we went, man, there was, you know, supplies down here and demand is up there. So yeah. we saw the skyrocket of prices from, it was probably May, maybe it was even April. And then it, it went all the way almost to the end of the year. Um, and, and as you know, the end of the year wrapped up and, and there was a short reprieve and, um, I think people started to think there was going to be a, a, a quicker fix to COVID than there was, and prices dropped pretty quick mm -hmm. because they were at such historical highs. Now, um, if you're a commodity trader, a lot of times you'll you'll start buying at, at a point you feel comfortable with, and maybe you'll buy three or four cars, and then you say, hey, the market looks pretty sound. Everything I'm seeing shows that it, it's going to keep growing here, and you'll buy a couple more, and you kind of fuel that market. Um, and, and as, as the prices get up, you start to back that down, right? And nobody out there can go and hit a home run and buy 10 cars at the absolute bottom of the market, right? And have them all sold by the peak. So I always use a terminology, you try to hit, you know, singles and doubles and, and play a very conservative uh, approach in the market. Um, and I guess where I'm, where I'm going with that, the prices got so high at the um, end of 2020 that everybody was kind of like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, we're buying two by four 16s at whatever it was, $18 a pop or something to speak in, you know, dollar terms. And um, we had a reprieve, it came down, everybody saw that it wasn't, housing was still booming, everything was still uh, going and mills couldn't keep up and everybody bought everything they could and we went right back up to where we, where we were by like February of um, 2021. And then 2021 was, uh, you know, a, a pretty monstrous year till about summer. And then uh, as summer, everything kind of plateaued again, and you saw a big drop in in prices. Prices got so inflated, people, you know, builders are doing everything from saying, hey, lumber's so high that we're going to, you know, roll back different things. So um, th there was a pullback on prices. And then ever since then, it's kind of been a little more, the spikes haven't been as pronounced. So to give you about a, a snapshot of the last two years, yeah. two and a half years, that's where we were. Yeah, it looks like it's kind of going sideways since uh, middle of summer. Yeah, I mean, you're uh, starting to see the interest rates in the housing market start to all really pump the brakes. And, uh, you know, I, I, I would be shocked if we see any other major major spikes this is my opinion but as interest rates are coming up few and few people are going to be buying those homes we just came off a, a big round of of you know people moving into homes or upgrading into homes so i think we're going to see a pause on the home building side especially with interest rates um and you'll you should see lumber plateau here for a bit yeah yeah i think uh they just released the um that home builders uh, sentiment index or something this this week or yeah past past week and it's the uh, the lowest it's been and i forgot a long time <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so yeah i definitely think uh um i agree with you i think uh things are gonna slow down a little bit here um so it did i guess the craziness uh in this world too i mean we got all kinds of uh, geopolitical nonsense going on uh and i know you guys deal with like uh, russian birch and and those yeah. kind of hardwoods and stuff are you got can you talk about how that's impacted y'all are you are you able 
to get uh, that uh, material still, or what's that look like? Yeah, that's a great question, Seth. Um, I'll maybe I'll start answering this by kind of giving a quick overview of all where you know, I'll speak to plywood specifically and specific kind of to the overlays for concrete forming. But you know, out, of, out of South America, predominantly what you would bring in would be uh, BBOE plywood. So certain markets, you know, kind of where you're up there in the DC market, they'll still use BB for, um, you know, horizontal shoring and stuff like that. But a lot of bridge civil will use the, the BB plywood, not a whole lot of overlays that, that, uh, eucalyptus radiate pine that comes out of there. just doesn't stay flat. So as soon as we put an overlay on it, it really wants to cup and it's just not a great, uh, you know, species of, of trees to put overlays on, um, North America, um, kind of self-explained, but Asia, there, there's a lot of PSF, phenolic surface film, the black or brown type Dynia paper that comes out of Asia. Um, it's not the highest of quality, um, but it's a price point. So I think a lot of guys that are saying, hey, we're going to handset this and we know we're plow a bunch of nails into whatever type system and we're only going to get two or three pours, they make that, that ply would work for them. Um, you know, other markets, they want a, a higher grade, and that's where, like, the Russian PSF really comes in. Maybe uh, our guys are building tables, and they're going to fly tables in and out of a building. You're kind of making a gang, and, and that's where that panel would really shine. Yeah. Um, so you have all these unique kind of price components, quality components that uh, we do bring into the States um, on, on a regular basis. Um, so speaking specifically to the, uh, the Russian PSF, uh, that definitely dried up here as soon as the, the war started. Um, all orders that were kind of open with those mills dried up and, you know, can canceled that material. Um, I think there's more of that veneer that's flowing into Asia now, and those mills are trying to, to build with that plywood. We're not at UFP necessarily trying to chase that, uh, you know, that business and support that through that that sneaky path i'm going to call it right um you still have to have a mill that's capable of sorry i'm drinking here of course no worries you still have to have a mill that can appropriately dry the veneer apply the correct amount of glue um hold it in the press the right amount of time cure the paper the right amount of time so there's a lot of science in making a good overlay panel and so just because you could get a russian high quality Baltic birch veneer doesn't mean that they can make a, a high quality panel. So um, have seen it come in to the United States already um, from Asian countries and they're calling it that Russian birch, uh, but we just haven't gone down that path. So I got gotcha. you. So you're saying uh, the, the another country's buying it from Russia and then they're applying the, the veneer to it. Are yeah. they applying the veneer to it and then they're bringing it to the U S and trying to sell it as Russian birch. Yeah, there's uh, two ways they can do it. They can buy the log, and then they would have lathes there that they would peel the veneer um, uh -huh. or buy the veneer and lay up the panels. Huh. Hard. So Interesting. It wouldn't be surprised, you know, you say geopolitics and all this. I mean, there's duties already in place from uh, buying overlay panels, bringing them to the United States. I think it's like 22 23% duty uh, that you have to pay. To, to bring those panels into the U.S., so I wouldn't be surprised. And if that all of a sudden increases and that, you know, I could see them adding other duties or whatever to try to curb that. I got gotcha. you. Uh, and I, I was just remind. I don't know if this was uh, uh, relevant or not, but uh, was there some issue with a product coming out of Brazil, too, or something recently this year? Um, you know. There, there has been. There's only a few mills down there that'll put uh, an overlay on it. And all right, I'll get nerdy a little bit on on overlays. So. That's why we're here, Ryan. <laughs> uh, if you have a, a PSF panel that I made, it'll have a paper on the on the front and the back, um, and that'll keep the panel flat. Um, MDO is a, a great panel, but you're going to have paper on on one side, and so what happens is. That paper, the side of the panel that has the paper can't take on moisture, and that's mm -hmm. the whole re reason why we're putting that uh, paper over there is to keep the water, the alkalinity, all of that out of the panel that will ultimately break it down and wear it out. 
So on those species that are in South America, that radiata pine, that eucalyptus pine, uh, the tree grows so fast, the growth rings, you know, are an eighth inch thick, right? Much, much uh, thicker than anything you'd find in the Baltic states or in, you know, northern North America with Doug fir type stuff. So the tree grows really fast, it doesn't stay stable. You put the paper on the one side, now you're making it unbalanced and everything wants to, uh, you know, deflect and stuff. And so if you're up on a I'm just going to call it a modern day drop head type system and you've got lightweight members up there and you're trying to nail a cup MDO panel down. It's miserable that it's uh-huh. pulling up the beams off the, the shoring system and, and everything else. So, um, we don't import a whole lot of overlay out of South America, just, just for that, that reason. Um, and they've struggled with some adhesion issues with the glues and stuff, stuff like that too. Yeah. So it sounds like depending on where you're sourcing the wood, that each species of wood has a, it has a, uh, has a use. And as long as you stick with that use and not try to use that species of wood for something else, uh, you're fine. But uh, sounds like we're uh, last couple of years, people are trying to get creative to uh, fill in the gaps that we're having. Um, because of, yeah. you know, the various challenges that we're having. Yep. Yeah. Something to think about, uh, um, domestically are you, is there, uh, I, I, I've seen one or two, uh, uh, announcements, but are you seeing, uh, more mills, uh, being uh, started in the, the States right now? What's, what's, what's the status on, on, on that front? Yeah. Um, you know, from the, the sawmill perspective, um, we've definitely seen some some sawmills open. Uh, OSB from the home building side of the business, we've seen some there. Not necessarily with uh, the plywood, Seth, um, that there hasn't been any new mills or, or anything. I think that you, you've seen a lot of capital improvements within the mills um, and, and that side of it. And, uh, you know, there was a, a plywood mill that burnt down in Oregon and it um, it was rebuilt and went to new ownership with, with Swanson. That was probably be the newest plywood mill and that was a handful of years ago. But um, our domestically, the our overlays suppliers that are contributing to the North American market are all, are all the same and I don't see a whole lot of new or changes coming there. So the majority of the wood, is it uh, that we use here in the States? Where Where is it coming from? Is it Canada, Canadian wood? Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's really three overlay. I'm going to speak again just to um, the, our, our overlay side to specifically concrete forming. So there's, there's three up in uh, the Western Canadian um, province, British Columbia. Um, and then North America, we have... I'm going to say four that do it on a on a regular basis, and that's Oregon, uh, up into Washington. Okay, huh? So all all Doug first species. So we need to uh, be keep friendly with Canada to keep the wood flowing this way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're too nice. I don't know how you could ever get mad at a, <laughs> mad at Canada. It, not. Not mad at the Canadians, just mad at the leadership. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Yeah, so that gives us kind of the, uh, what uh, wood, um, uh, the market of wood. I was curious about that. Thank you, Ryan, for answering that. That's, that's good stuff. Um, now, uh, t- as far as technologies that are out there, so you guys, I, I was sharing with you before we got started, uh, I was introduced to you all, I think, about six or seven years ago, um, and the the whole uh, premise of that was pre-building um, uh, different form work that we use on uh, on the job, and th- this was a very very unique job um, that uh, we were working on, and uh, uh, someone suggested, um, I guess, from your side. Uh, <laughs> about pre pre building uh some components on it um so that i I know you you all do a lot of that work and then you do a lot of uh the the form form work as well um you build form work systems um out of out of wood so the to compete against the uh 
the, uh, what, I guess the Dokas and the Perrys of the world out there, right? Yeah. Um, can you speak to uh, any trends or, or any technologies out there that you all are seeing uh, with with what you all are doing? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think from a technology perspective, Seth, one one thing that's really unique to what we can offer is we're we're pretty much outside every major metro market within the United States, and all of those facilities generally have um, CNCs, high speed molders, um, you know, very factory built settings to to manufacture and process wood components very quickly and accurately. Um, so it's definitely something that we found is a benefit to the, the concrete forming industry. And it can be as something simple as a job site may need 300 bean sites. And with our ability to, to cut those two by fours lightning quick versus maybe somebody in the field with a chop saw or a circular saw or something trying to do it, we can build them, you know, four times, five times faster. Um, there's some security, I think, from the, the job site perspective from, from your perspective of, Hey, we want to control this cost and know what we're going to pay for this. And, you know, we take that, uh, something happens that you can't explain a, a weather event or whatever. And it, and it causes a, you know, a monetary adjustment on, on your budgeting side, you know, we're managing that now, right. Um, by taking on that, that fabrication side. So, uh, you get into like a, a radius type form, um, you know, maybe it's a, a pier cap that has like a bullnose edge on a bridge. Um, maybe it's just uh, some radius perimeter walls, you name it. Um, we use our CNCs on a regular basis to cut funky objects for the, the concrete forming industry, whether they're, you know, block outs in a wall or, uh, you know, a bullnosed feature at a, a water treatment plant. Um, our CNCs are making radius type form work all, all the time. And those are just unique, um, you know, computer controlled solutions to get highly accurate um, forming products, wood based into the market. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I think that's uh, um, something you guys uh, can help with is unique things, but also things that are very re repetitive on on jobs. Because uh, maybe, maybe people know this or maybe not that listen to the podcast. But on every uh, concrete construction job um, where there's elevated uh, work, you're going to see a a, uh, a a saw table set up somewhere, and and yeah. guys are cutting hacking wood to uh, to to form work, um, you know, to form up decks or columns or whatever walls. And uh, what uh, what we need to work on as an industry is try to figure out those things that we can pre-build ahead of time and have them shipped to the job. So once that hits the job, they're ready to go. So it's a, it's a, it's a fine balance between, uh, uh, I guess, finding those things that, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a fab shop can be produced, uh, more cheaply. And, um, and also, uh, I guess now we got to deal with, uh, transportation costs too though so you got to weigh all that in there now um yeah. so yeah it's 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 definitely challenging out there um i think uh on a previous podcast we were talking about uh um ideal jobs for form work guys is, is there an ideal job that you guys look out for that you're like oh that's a that's a that's a job we can help with definitely <laughs> uh great question you know i think just um, maybe it's ego. I don't know what it is, but our sales team tends to just gravitate towards the bigger and the, the larger projects. Uh, just they're probably more glamorous and, you know, high rise construction and stuff like that. Um, they're great. There does become exactly what you're talking about. A lot of repetitive work that we can certainly help, um, you know, door bucks, um, handrail stanchions around the, uh, you know, perimeters, uh, floor blockouts, beam sides, uh, it can go, I could go on and on, you know, we'll, we'll rip, uh, plywood all day long for the, uh, all your edge of deck form work, um, particle board, if they're pulling PT through it, stuff, stuff like that. So, um, it, 
there's a, a tremendous amount we can produce in, in high-rise construction. Uh, water treatment also just has a, a lot of unique blockouts and stuff within the walls, penetrations and stuff, digesters in the bottom. So lots of unique type blockout formwork. Uh, I like doing the unique because it makes you think and you have to find good solutions that are practical based on the formwork that's there. Maybe it's modular formwork and we got to make a block out out of wood that'll work within somebody else's system. Do that all the time. Maybe it's, you know, making it work within our own systems that we produce out of wood. So I like to find those, those unique, unique one-off solutions. It makes you think a little bit more. Yeah. Do, uh, do you guys do like the shop drawings and everything for a job or do you, is most of your stuff kind of like you're filling in where maybe another formwork uh, company is lacking uh most often we produce the the drawings in-house um and, and we'll present we produce both a, a fabrication internally and then we'll produce a a field application too if it's something simple you know beam cider or something like that there wouldn't be field drawings but if it's something more more complicated and a cycling pattern or a reuse pattern or something like that there'll be field drawings that would go out to the the field Gotcha. Yes. Um, and that goes, so you do beam sides. Um, and do, do you guys do like the, the cores, like core walls, shear walls, all that stuff too? Yeah. In the, the vertical formwork side, um, we do a tremendous amount of the gates lock fast columns. Uh, so we've got a large rental inventory of that system around the United States from Boston to Seattle, San Diego to Miami, and everywhere in between. So just build a tremendous amount of gates lock fast columns. Uh, we have a lot of solutions for that system, uh, for controlling heights, you know, varying heights and walls to uh, large columns. We start to call them volumes because columns just keep getting bigger and bigger for some reason. So we started to call them volumes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, what, uh, maybe barrier cable that's on the perimeter of the building how we um, can limit having to drill that column so you can keep it cycling through the interior of the building also, but build a tremendous amount of columns. Uh, and then cores, shear walls, you're right. Um, we have two systems. One's uh, Gates number nine system, which is basically four by four LVL. It, it's a self-spreading tie. It's lightweight, a very architectural finish. Um, build a tremendous amount of those, especially out in your neck of the woods there. And, North Carolina is DC, Virginia, um, up to that market. And then you know, Miami, West Coast, we have a, a butt plate whaler. It's a six inch double C channel that goes with four by six LVL. Um, does the same thing, just bigger tie pattern. Rebar is a little denser in these markets. Um, and it makes sense just to have a, a little bigger, bigger system to get ties spread out, less rebar fighting, that type thing. Yeah. And as on the uh, on the uh, shop drawing side, um, are you guys doing anything unique out there? I, I was I was trying to talk into uh, 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 on another podcast. We were talking about uh, bringing a augmented reality into construction, where you basically uh, instead of having physical shop drawings, uh, the uh, um, carpenter would actually have. Uh, some uh like a pair of safety glasses and as he's looking through the safety glasses he could kind of he, he sees the formwork shop drawings in front of him have you seen anything like that yet any uh is it or is yeah, it my uh, uh you know we we use revit today so all of our models of our formwork are we have revit models so if we can get the revit model of the concrete from from the customer then we kind of take our our models and we can lay that into the concrete. We don't have to go redraw the, the actual structure. We're gonna start applying the, the forms to the system. So, um, but there, there's a company in California we've been talking to that's not necessarily with goggles, but um, being able to show our formwork in a 3D model where you can start spinning it around and seeing where, you know, maybe how much the formwork's slapping or what the next jump's gonna look like. And if there's gonna be a, an issue with, uh, a rebar element, uh, you know, rebar boundaries, something like that. Oh, cool. So you're, yeah, you're it's, modeling it's definitely the... coming it. They have yeah. some pretty amazing, uh, 3d modeling and shoring that they're already starting to do. 
Yeah. Yeah, then, like you said, you can avoid uh, conflicts in the field, hopefully ahead of time, and it it's, uh, keeps things moving instead of uh, trying to uh, figure it out as you're, uh, you know, as you hit uh, an issue and, and then in the, you, you, everyone's stopping and looking at each other and what do we do from here? And yeah, get, flipping through a bunch of pages back and forth, yeah. trying to, you know, look at a set of drawings to see what it looks like in the field. And then you can instantly look at that and it all is showing everything all at once in a, in a 3d models. It's yeah. helpful. This helps people wrap their head around it a lot faster. Yeah. Otherwise they're calling Ryan and Ryan's jumping on an airplane, going to a job site, right? Yeah. In the hotel <laughs> that you see in my background here. Absolutely. That's, that's right. Well, Ryan, uh, I think that's a good spot, uh, to end the conversation today. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, if folks want to reach out to you and learn more about, uh, you and UFP and what y'all are up to, what's the best way? Yeah. Um, yeah. My cell phone's always on. That number is 970-988-3064. You can kick me an email. My email is rbenson, R-B-E-N-S-O-N, at ufpi.com. Yep, and we'll uh, I'll put your stuff in the show notes. So when we send out the uh, podcast, if you guys check out the uh, whatever podcast, uh, software app you're using to listen to um b- below the uh details on the podcast i'm gonna, gonna put uh, his contact information so t- check him out reach out to ryan thanks again for doing this appreciate it appreciate it Seth. thank you yes sir thank you for joining us for another concrete logic podcast episode if you got some value out of this or you enjoyed it please share it with others And if you could take a moment and give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast listening app, I would appreciate it. We will uh, catch you on the next episode. And now Mike Dutton is going to take us out. Ring, ring, that alarm always sings a couple hours before the sun comes up. Open up the side, put some diesel in the lights, and wait till the trucks roll up. Yeah, this ain't how most folks live their lives. Dripping in sweat, working overtime. But while they're tying their ties for their nine to fives, we're out here changing these skylines with wood, iron, and mud. We work hard for a dollar, give thanks to the Lord. Hard to